Um, we're actually going to be jumping into YouTube. And the reason, uh, you might have noticed in some of the previous webinars, uh, some of the audio was a little weird, but uh, we're going to be doing our live streams in YouTube now. So uh, inside this Crowdcast event, we're going to be um, kind of having our community focus. So type in the chat. You guys can interact inside of here. Um, and we're going to be looking at the actual me presenting with the screen and the audio quality is going to be much higher in YouTube. So click the button at the bottom that says click here to watch webinar. And now you should be able to watch um, the YouTube live stream of what I'm going to show you guys. So go ahead and click on that. And we'll get started. So just give me a thumbs up or a heads up um, if you click that that button to make sure that it's working so you guys are going to YouTube and you can see a live stream of my screen. So that way I know we're good before I jump ship. Cool. Yeah, it works. Awesome. So yeah, fundamentals for creating a great mix. So I just wanted to, uh, yeah, I put, I put some good pictures in here for you. So kind of starting from scratch, if you have been mixing for a long time and you know, you're already way more experienced, uh, this might not be ideal for you, but I'm basically just going through and I kind of compiled a presentation of all the things that I've found over the last couple of years learning and working in the studio from a lot of really great artists and people who have worked with like platinum and Grammy engineers, just kind of picking their brains on different things, kind of organizing it into what are the necessary tools that you need to use to be able to create really good tracks and things that I've seen work and a lot of trial and error. But very, very from the beginning, first things first, like you're only as good as you can hear, right? So if you're deaf, you probably shouldn't be producing tracks and making music. And if you are listening on Apple headphones to mix all of your things and to do all your mixing and mastering, you're probably not going to get the best sounding tracks. Um, so getting good headphones and speakers for those that are on a budget, that's the first things first. If you can afford speakers, definitely go for it. Otherwise, good headphones work. The headphones I'm wearing right now are Sony MDRs. They're like 99 bucks. Definitely worth it. But they're actually made for mixing. So you want to get good mixing headphones if you're going to produce music. Second thing is acoustic room treatment. So I tell people if I had... Um, if I only had a small budget, I would spend more of that budget on the actual acoustic room treatment itself. Speakers are nice. It's nice to have the biggest, sexiest, largest speakers in the world to like listen to music super loud. But the reality is, is the honesty of the speakers is really going to be determined by the room you're in. So I would much rather have not great speakers but like okay speakers with the most amazing acoustic room treatment than to have a room that's not treated and it's too small and have the most amazing speakers because you'll never actually listen to the accurate representation of what's being played through those speakers so that's helpful to know and if you go to acousticfields.com i put it on here um, you guys will be able to watch this later we'll post the video hey iliag's here what's up um so if, we, uh, if you go to AcousticFeels.com, uh, the guy that did the acoustic treatment for my room, you can only see like half of it. I have a lot of other stuff over here and some big panel things. But he will do a free room analysis for you. His name's Dennis, super nice dude. And he's like next level. Like his brain works in ways that mine don't. And he will do like an analysis of your room. You just send him pictures and you send him the dimensions. And he'll customize um, like a layout for you and send you custom built things on your budget. So he's a great Great dude. Check out AcousticFeels.com. Free room analysis. Very important to have good acoustic room treatment. Um, Third-party plugins are great, like especially for people starting out. You know, they're like they want to run out and buy all the plugins in the world. I would say honestly, Ableton stock stuff is solid. Like especially with the upgrade of their sound engine to ten from nine to ten, Ableton like took it up a whole notch and they offered Echo. They have um, pedal. They have all these other good tools that you can use, and the compressors are great. The EQ sounds fine. You don't need to go out and buy all the fanciest plugins in the world. But if you do want to buy the fanciest plugins in the world and like get some really good stuff, these are the companies I highly recommend. FabFilter makes amazing stuff. Pro-Q2 by FabFilter is one of the most beautiful plugins I think the world has ever seen. Like My life will never be the same. It was beautiful. 
the day I found that. Um, Isotope, Slate Digital, Universal Audio, those are all the main big players who create software for professional mixing today. So that's that. So this is the perks. This is what I call the perks. Some of you guys have already heard this. But uh, if I had to say there was a checklist to make sure you touched all the main fundamentals to make sure your song sounds really great, I would put it into these five things, and they spell perks. It's just like a fun little word thing I came up with. Uh, so you have panning, EQ, reverb, compression, and saturation. And I'm going to go into each one of those, and we're going to spend the majority of this webinar talking about those things. So fundamentals in action, panning. Uh, you think about panning, you have a left speaker and a right speaker. Right now I have a left headphone on and a right headphone, and together they sit on both my ears. So that when I talk about the stereo field, that's what I'm talking about. So panning is important. I heard it said really well by uh, Daniel Wyatt. He, I've mentioned him many, many times. He's a platinum Grammy audio engineer. I worked with like Nora Jones and a lot of great people. He's a good friend of mine. But he said that like a good mix is as much visual as it is actually audible. And so listening to your mix, you should be putting people inside a room. You're actually creating a whole new environment. You're creating a whole new space. So having like a good um, pan is important. So thinking about panning your different instruments. So down in here, you'll see I in the drum rack, you have panning. And if I was to show you what that looks like, let's go inside Ableton, check this out. So if I go into my drum rack, um, you can see the panning is down in here. So typically I don't pan my snare too far to the left or the right because that just sounds weird and it would kind of like draw your ear every time the snare hits to the, to the right and it would be weird. Um, I always leave the kick down the middle. I always leave my snare pretty much down the middle. Maybe I'll offset it like one or two. And I know a lot of engineers and people do this. Um, and then uh, the hi-hats, think about like how a drummer positions his drum set. So then again, like think about that space you're creating for the listener. You want to be able to have things created in a, like a 3D environment. So panning is a really important way to do that. Um, same thing with the shakers over here. I've got these fun little shaker sounds. Um, I'm going to create um, the with the auto pan. If you go into audio effects, auto pan is really fun to use to create all kinds of movement within a song and make it interesting so it's not all boring and like in the middle in your face. So using the mount is really important on auto pan. It's a fun way. And you can even do it like on piano or pads. A lot of times I'll put it like on an ambient pad and I'll just kind of make have the auto pan like slowly move stuff left or right just to create like this interesting movement. Um, so and then you can turn up the rate. So I just made this kind of slow. If I hit play, if you have headphones on or speakers, you're actually going to be able to hear this. If you're listening on your laptop or your phone, this is not going to mean anything to you. But uh, if I listen on the shaker, now you can actually tell. So let me solo it and hit play. It's a fun little shaker type of groove. But you can hear it, hopefully, if you have headphones or speakers, kind of panning to the left and the right. So panning, super important. It's one of the perks. Anyway, let's go back to our little, there we go. So yeah, panning. Uh, the next thing is EQing. So I created this visualization from Ableton's EQ8 device. And this is kind of where all like the main instruments live in a mix. So uh, for example, like your kick drum really is kind of living around here between like 100 Hertz to about like, uh, you know, 150 Hertz or so. And then it lives again up here where you get that punch, that top end kick of the kick drum is usually like one and a half K. And so your snare drum kind of lives in here. Your lead synths are usually living in here, your vocals, and just kind of getting a good idea of where everything, all the instruments that you're using in your mix, um, where they live and being able to EQ to those specific things. Uh, also, the human ear can only hear between 2020. So think about it like vision, right? Like if you have perfect vision, you have 2020 vision. It's kind of the same thing with listening with your ear. So um, most people can't really hear below like 40 hertz, but technically you can as a human. Like if you have like a dog whistle and you blow on a dog whistle, you know, how like dogs like perk up and freak out when people blow on those when their dog's in trouble or something because they pooped on the carpet or whatever. Uh, dogs can hear like way above 20,000 hertz and that's what that whistle is playing. It's playing something up to like 50,000 or something that we can't hear. Otherwise, we would all be barking and going crazy too. But yeah, so EQing, there's really two ways to EQ and I'll show you what I mean in a second. You have reductive and additive. 
Um, so reductive is just you're carving out those frequencies in here. So you're cutting out certain parts of this frequency range. Additive is you're boosting things to really kind of bring those out in the mix so they stand out where they sound really pleasant and nice and pleasing to the ear. Uh, and here's another tip is cutting out imaginary frequencies will definitely clean up your overall mix. Even if it's not super obvious, if you have say uh, like a lead synth sound and you have like a big sub bass sound playing at the same time, then if you, um, if you cut off like down here and the lead synth is really living up here, if you cut off any of this low sub frequencies or like extra, extra high frequencies up there, then in the very end, after all these different instruments start playing together, it's going to make a difference. Your, your entire mix is actually going to sound a little bit cleaner because your speakers become more efficient. And when you're listening on tiny little Apple headphones or, you know, like a speaker in your kitchen, like your Alexa Echo Dot, whatever, Google Home speaker, um, those can only reproduce so much sound between a certain frequency range. And so if you're cutting out things that are unnecessary that can't be heard anyway, it actually is going to play back better on those speaker systems. So, yeah. Also, um, let me show you a quick example of that inside Ableton. So, for example, if I go into... Uh, a perfect example is really using a kick drum. So down here in the drum rack, if I was to go into my kick and my drum rack, let me close this out so we can see a little easier. If I was to drop, say, an EQ8 on my kick and I hit play, let me loop this. Then, oops, it's solo. There we go. And I look inside of that EQ. There's, you're really not going to want to hear all that extra sub build up down there. And there's really not a lot you're hearing up here with the kick drum itself. So if I do a cut, this is pretty typical. I'll always do a cut. A high, this is what we call a high pass filter. It's allowing all the high frequencies to pass through and it's cutting off anything lower. And I'll usually just standard. I know a lot of engineers do this. They just always cut around 30 hertz on a kick drum. And it actually makes the kick drum sound a little bit tighter and it's gonna just make it sound better. Um, so this is what you'd call reductive EQ, which is what we looked at earlier. And then um, also uh, additive EQ, additive, uh, I can't talk, additive EQ. So if you wanted to um, find things that might be pleasant for boosting, then I would take this curve and I would just boost it, say like uh, 10 dB or so, and I would tighten up this Q so that band gets a little more narrow. And then this is what you call sweeping. And I just sweep back and forth to listen to anything that's either pleasing or unpleasing. And I'll just listen in the overall mix and I'll make a decision to cut or to add things where it sounds good. So you're really just kind of sculpting stuff together in the puzzle of all these instruments and how they work together. Typically, I'll always, on a kick drum, make a cut around like 500 hertz or so. So if I take this frequency knob, usually around like 450 to 550 if you make a cut, it actually sounds a lot tighter. So let me turn off the EQ8 and just hit play. And now let's listen without it again. Now with it. It's very slight, it's very subtle. Um, but definitely cutting out any frequencies that are necessary are important. And then you can also boost them. So usually around like one and a half K, you can make that kick drum pop a little more. So let's solo it. So it makes it a little bit brighter and punch a little bit harder. So that's EQing. I'm not going to go much deeper than that for now because uh, this is just going to be a short, sweet webinar. I'm going to actually do more webinars later where I actually show you how I'd walk through from start to finish mixing an entire song. Right now I'm just giving you exposure to the necessary tools for a lot of you starting out or just kind of wanting a more concrete way of understanding how to mix. So let's go back to the presentation. There. So the next thing is reverb. 
Um, we have reverb all around us, 24-7, all over the place. The room I'm in has reverb. The room you're in has reverb. That's what makes every room sound the way it does. So if you have more reverb, um, so down here you see the dry-wet mix. If I turn that up, then it's going to make that instrument sound farther away. Um, the less reverb you have, um, the closer to you that instrument lives. And so when you start thinking about it, a lot I see a lot of producers first starting out, and they're dropping like crazy amounts of reverb on every different instrument. And every instrument has its own reverb, and that's not really a, the best way to use reverb because reverb you have to think about it in a room and if you're putting every instrument in a different room then they don't ever get to hang out and they're all by themselves and the instruments are lonely and they don't have friends and so we want to all the instruments to have friends and be able to play together in the same room so i broke down reverb into these different types of reverb that can be used in an overall mix all together so the first is a room. So everything goes to the same room. And I'll show you how I'll do that in a second. But I put everything in the same room. And that creates a cohesive sound for all the instruments if they're all going to the same reverb. And that's when we use return tracks. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, the second kind of reverb is a large hall, which not all of the instruments get to play in and they don't all get to hang out together. That's just for the main lead instruments. And that, that special reverb allows them to kind of pop out in the mix a little bit more. And that's super important for those main instruments like your lead synth or your vocal or whatever. Um, and then I always have a dedicated snare. And I learned this from Danny and some other people from different studios is always having a special reverb just for your snare drum. And that makes that snare really pop. And that snare drum is going to be kind of the driving factor, especially in dance music. You want the snare to kind of stand out, and creating that reverb makes it have a little bit of a tail to it and a little bit extra space um, that kind of drives the snare. And then, oops, and then the fourth kind is like ethereal, and this is kind of optional. Like if you ever listen to like melodic EDM that just makes you feel like you're like rolling and tripping balls and like it's just this crazy huge space that's like out of this world and it's hyper realistic uh, it's that special effect and that can be fun to use on an individual instruments um, and sometimes you can blend like your main leads into that just a little bit to give it this huge space spacey presence if that's what you're going for um, so let me kind of show you how I would use these things so let me go back into Ableton and the way I do that is if I open up my, my return tracks, then I generally have my room. So this would be my room reverb. And then I have my large hall. Um, and you can go into Ableton's audio effects. And Ableton has these categorized for you already. So let me go into reverb, and I'll open this up. And I have my hall. So these are a bunch of diff different, like, really big big hall spacey reverbs that you can drop and send your individual instruments to. So um, for my room, I actually will send everything to a room, like I was saying earlier. So I'll pull down this for everything. And what I do is go one by one through each instrument, and I slowly turn up a little bit of the room. And remember, like I said, if you turn up something all the way, so if I have it all the way to zero, it's 100% going to that room sound. Let me just kind of show you an example. See how, see how spacey that sounds? So it sounds farther away in the mix, and now that guitar is like really in the front because it's dry. So I'll kind of send drums maybe a little bit to it, say just maybe like to like minus 50 or so. And then um, the shakers, I'll put those a little bit behind the drums, so I'll make that like minus 45. And then I've got this ambient pad. Maybe I'll send a little bit more of that ambient pad to it. And then uh, my bass guitar. Bass usually doesn't get a lot of reverb uh, because if you have a lot of bass building up in a reverb that's constantly building up and building up and building up, then that can sometimes make the mix sound really muddy unless that's kind of what you're going for. So I generally send the least amount to the bass when it comes to sending reverb. Um, so I'll just like barely touch it with like minus 60 and then my lead guitar I'll also keep it close so I'll send it to like maybe like minus 50 or so I'm just giving you general numbers here 
and then the large hall. So that's like my lead. So I would send a little more. I would just send that only to my select lead instruments, like my lead electric guitar. So let me unsolo it. Yeah, so there you go. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea. But that's reverb, so play with that. And then also, like I said, on the snare drum. So I will go into my drum rack, and I'll drop a dedicated snare reverb on there as well. I think it's this one. I'm going to put one on there. Yeah. So now, if we listen to how dry the snare is on this, let me solo it. It just sounds really dry, kind of like too dry. It's like when you buy really cheap toilet paper and it's just not comfortable. You know what I'm talking about? I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. That's kind of how I feel with snares that are just too dry. It's like the toilet paper you don't want to use, you know? And then you kind of need to add a little bit to it. So I'll, I'll put the snare reverb directly on there. And if you go into the reverb preset there, and it's in special. So if I type in snare in the browser, then I can open up the room and there's that snare room. That's what I drag and dropped on here. And then I just use the dry wet to kind of dial it back a little bit. And I'm actually going to change the preferences because my computer is starting to cry a little bit. I had a lot going on with all the routing I have. All right, so let's listen again. It's a huge difference in how dry it is. So yeah, dedicated snare reverb for the win every time. All right, let's go back. So yeah, that's reverb. And two more fundamentals that we're going to go through real quick. Uh, the next one is compression. I feel like compression is something that you continue to learn how to use forever and ever. And it's probably the most difficult thing in the mixing world to really master and understand. But I'm going to try to explain it in a basic way that helps you guys understand to start using compression. If you haven't already started using a lot of compression in your tracks. Um, a lot of people think that compressors make stuff louder. And it actually does the opposite. And the reason is, is because the makeup gain is automatically on, on a compressor. So if I go to a track that has a compressor on it. Um, or if you drop a new compressor on, say like this drum loop, then let me turn this off. Then immediately, if I turn on a compressor, because this makeup gain is on, it automatically turns up the output as I'm pulling down the threshold. So people think compressors usually just make stuff louder, but it doesn't. And a compressor, what it's really doing is it's just uh, reducing the dynamic range. And what I mean by that is um, it makes quiet stuff. A little bit louder and it makes louder stuff a little bit quieter so it's perfect for like vocals uh, vocals usually have a lot of compression drums usually have a lot of compression because they're extremely dynamic and compression can be great because it really can bring stuff like forward in the mix um, it's awesome because I mean if you if you squash something really hard and then you turn up the output of a compressor then it can really make it sound like in your face um, but sometimes if you over compress something then it sounds really thin and really like smashed in a bad way. It's like really, really, really thin stuff that you don't like. So you kind of have to find that proper balance of like controlling the dynamic range and the loudest and the quietest peaks of different instruments. That's basically what compression's doing. Um, on a deeper level, there's something called side chaining, which I'll show you in a second. And there's two types of side chaining. If you ever listen to like a song where you have like a synth and a kick drum and every time the kick hits the synth ducks out of the way and so the, it creates like this huge swelling effect like a rhythm that's basically side chaining for like what I would call for sound design and then you have side chaining for mixing and let me show you an example of this so if I go back into Ableton um, we've got a couple different compressors I'm going to show you so let me turn off these for now um, so for the compressor, uh, for these, these drums, this drum loop I have over here, if I hit play, 
if I really squash it with the threshold, the ratio is basically how strong the compressor is working. The attack is how long it takes for the compressor to react when the first initial hit happens, such as like any one of these peaks. And then the release, for now, I, I usually just leave auto release on, um, and that's how long it takes for the compressor to let go. So uh, if I pull down the threshold, you can hear it like completely just squashes it. So usually I'll, I'll just kind of have a happy balance of gain reduction and use my ears. And for drums, I usually like a ratio of like six or seven to one. I usually give a fair amount of compression because it really allows it to like punch a little bit harder without it, without like killing it. And another fun trick is if you um, pull back the dry wet a little bit, say to like, 60% or so and you really smash it and you have a high ratio like say like 10 to 1 or 12 to 1 so the compressor is really working hard um, but you're only getting part of the signal then you can really make the drums punch without over squashing them by pulling down the threshold farther than you normally would so now if I turn off the compressor And it hits a little bit harder. It's a little more punchy sounding. Um, the glue compressor is awesome. The glue compressor in Ableton in the audio effects folder. All these are in the audio effects, if you didn't know. But the glue compressor is great because it actually models the SSL compressor, which is like one of the most famous compressors out there. So um, I'll usually, um, it has like a um, really less knobs to play with but this thing has like kind of its own sound and I would definitely encourage you to play with that that thing's pretty fun uh, with Ableton 10 they came out with the drum bus and I love the drum bus because it has like a built-in saturator in it and I'll tell you a little bit more about saturation in a second uh, but you can definitely like drive the sound and you can turn up the transients and this will make it punch a little bit harder and you can really crunch it. And then um, when I turn on the compressor, this is the compressor button down here. When I turn on the compressor, usually it makes it super loud. So I'll pull down the trim so the input's not too loud and it doesn't peak and like sound like it's going to blow up. Um, or turn down the output over here as well. So definitely play with the drum bus if you haven't already. The thing's amazing. Even to use that like on a piano. Like if I was to throw the like the drum bus on like keys or a piano, you can get some really cool sounds out of that. But the last thing I want to show you guys, um, we're running out of time, but the last thing I want to show you is saturation. Saturation, I feel like not enough people are using saturation. It makes instruments like fatter and thicker. And there's a lot of great plugins out there. Like Sound Toys is awesome. Um, if you go to like soundtoys.com, they have something called a decapitator. Um, Ableton has pedal, which is like an emulation of a guitar pedal. And that thing's really cool to use like on synths or even bass or keys or drums. Like just try throwing that on and just turning it on like on any instrument. You can get some really cool saturation out of it. And saturation is just a fancy, fancy word for distortion. And there's good distortion and bad distortion. Bad distortion is what you call digital distortion. It's unnatural. Analog distortion is basically like what you'd have with like tape machines back in the 70s, and it's a lot more natural sounding to our ears. Um, digital distortion is like if you go into Ableton and you end up turning up the output too loud, and you notice that this is clipping. So if any one of these meters turn yellow, that's really bad. That just means that's what you call digital distortion. So yeah, um, I kind of went through and played with these. There's that lead electric guitar. If you just turn on pedal, it just sounds so much better. I love this thing. So if I, let me solo it so you can actually hear it. And if I turn it off, this is what it sounds like without it. And with it. And then you have the EQ here so you can do additive EQ or reductive EQ for the bass, the mid, and the treble. So I turned down the bass a little bit, and I turned on sub. This gives it a little extra boost in the low end. I think it's like around like 50 hertz. It gives it a little bump. 
and sometimes it's too much so i'll turn down the bass a little bit on that sub um, and then i'll turn down the output the output a little bit and you've got three different flavors inside pedal of different distortion types <laughs> So I like the OD, which stands for overdrive. So that's a good saturator. Then you have saturation in here. This is the saturator for Ableton. So you can just kind of hear before and after. And then there's the overdrive. I honestly don't use this too much, but maybe I should because I was playing with it today and actually you can get some cool stuff out of it. And using the dry wet is a great way to kind of blend the sound because you can make stuff sound way too aggressive. So most Ableton effects have a dry wet knob. So I encourage you to like go really crazy with distorting stuff and then use the dry wet to kind of pull it back to taste. And anything you do in the mixing world, um, I was always taught to like just way overdo it so you really know what you're doing and then kind of back it off slowly until it sounds good in the overall mix. And I know I was solo soloing a lot of stuff, but I generally um, find it's a better practice not to solo as you're mixing, because then you can hear what's actually happening to the instrument you're messing with in the overall mix. So I definitely encourage you not to be soloing as you're mixing your tracks, um, because then you can really hear what's happening as the instrument is being played with everything else. So just to recap really quick, if you want to create a good mix, pay attention to how all your instruments are panned. So that's P and then E for EQing. So go through and EQ each one of your tracks after that. Um, and then going in and choosing um, the right reverb. Usually I do that last at the end of my tracks. I'll go through and start adding like that room reverb and that large hall to the right instruments that I was mentioning earlier. And then um, compression. Uh, gen there's no... There's no one size fits all when it comes to mixing. Um, generally, uh, I'll do some reductive EQ and then I'll compress and then I'll do some additive EQ and then maybe I'll compress it again with another compressor. So, um, like I said, there's there's a lot of like what ifs in the world of mixing because not every song sounds the same and you're not using all the same tools. But uh, then you can also use saturation if something really stands out in the mix or doesn't stand out enough then you can mess with saturation and try to like bring it out in the mix by really adding a little subtle distortion to it. That's huge. Um, yeah, so panning, EQ, reverb, saturation, compression, all those things are kind of your checklist to create a really great sounding mix. That's what I've learned. So um, yeah, that's pretty much the gist of what I want to share with you guys. Just kind of short, sweet stuff that I've learned that hopefully gives you some concepts to work with and producing some super dope tracks. Also, one more thing I wanted to share with you. If you haven't already in the membership, I encourage you um, to check out the discussions forum. There's uh, in the discussion section, you'll see um, an area that says track feedback and another one says mixing and mastering. Post your tracks in there so people can like listen to it and give you advice. Maybe it's not just mixing. Maybe it's like, hey, like, what do you think of this? Or, um, you know, maybe you do want some feedback with your mixing in the mixing and mastering section. Then ask me questions in there. Ask other questions. Trying to build like a good social community and a family of producers. That's what this is all about, right? We're all we're all Ableton family. So, uh, yeah, be sure to talk to each other in the discussions forum. Uh, in conclusion practice and then when you have time to practice some more then do it and then keep practicing because that's the only way you're gonna get better at mixing uh, remember you're only as good as you can hear so have a good acoustic treated room if you can't afford it just get some awesome headphones um, like I said I have Sony MDRs Sennheiser makes great headphones or get some good speakers if you can afford it um, and if you have questions about getting like great speakers or whatever post it in the discussion section and uh, other members and myself will jump in there and give you some guidance on the right speakers or the right studio setup or any other questions you have. Um, compare your songs to others. So one of the last things I'll do is I'll, I'll go and I will, um, I'll take a song that I finished mixing and I'll take it to my car because I'm super familiar with my car speakers. So listen to your tracks, even if they're not completely done or finished mixed, uh, if you're not finished mixing them, like take them in your car and listen 
and compare it to other songs that you listen to on Spotify or Apple Music or whatever you're into and start comparing and listening to the differences um, in how they're mixing their track and how you're mixing yours. Just also remember as you're doing that, it's not a fair fight because your song isn't professionally mastered and theirs is, but hopefully it gives you a good idea with balancing the volume and the panning and the EQing and the saturation and the compression and thinking about those things. And that's super helpful. Also, don't burn out your ears. I have a rule. I'll set a timer, a little app on my phone, and um, I use like an SPL meter. So I don't listen louder than 85 decibels. There's some SPL meters out there that you can check out and get. Um, like if you, there's a couple apps. So an SPL meter just stands for sound pressure level. And uh, it's a way to read how loud something is as far as volume goes. So don't crank up your speakers too loud and blow your eardrums because then you won't be able to hear or make music and that's sad. Um, but there's apps on like the phone that you can download to, to just listen on your phone and know how loud something is in your studio as you're mixing. And I have like a 30 minute on like a 10 minute off rule. So I'll mix for like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then once that timer goes off, then I'll be like, all right, like I don't want to blow my eardrums. So then I'll force myself to take a break and go eat cereal or something. Uh, but yeah, uh, compare your songs, practice, check out those perks, make a little checklist to make sure you do those things and more coming soon. Um, if you guys have advice for future webinars, it's not always going to be me, but I, uh, if you have advice for future webinars, post that in the discussions forum section and I will be more than happy to, um, jump in and find, uh, some other Ableton producers that are really specialized in that area that you suggest to do future webinars. So much love, everybody. Have a fantastic Tuesday evening. I think it's Tuesday. Yeah, it's Tuesday. Have a great evening and uh, hopefully talk to you very, very soon. And yeah, good night. Peace out.